Okay, I'm going to talk about um, some fairly, it's fairly historical, goes back 20, 20 years, but it's, it, it also comes up to, to um, basically the last knowledge we have would have been before COVID. We haven't been back to the area since that, since um, 2017. Um, so um, first of all, acronyms, I'm, I'm, I belong, I work for the Northern Australia Quarantine Strategy. That's NARC's program, and there's be another acronym I'll explain in a minute. Um, so going back, way back in history, um, there was a time when the, our, our organization, NARCS, used to do surveys with the Indonesian quarantine authorities in the 1990s. And so the first, um, the, the, the first um, records of this pathosystem, this disease and this insect, date back to, um, the first record was from 1990 of, of the Cilid, and that wasn't actually uh, NARCS and Indonesian quarantine, that was an independent survey. But then, and where the Cilid was found right at the east of the country in Sarong. Yeah, I've um, got it now. I can, I, I, I turned off my network and it's not working now. And, um, and then in 1992, it was detected at the other still, end of the country adjacent to PNG. Um, and then okay, in you. 1999. Thank you. In 1999, we did joint surveys. Thank you, bye. Sorry, um, Richard. I'm uh, just going to ask. I think um, somebody's got their speaker on at the moment. Uh, so if you could just make sure, I think it's Jean Lai, you've got your speaker on, perhaps. I'll just check. So, Richard, sorry, I didn't want to interrupt you, but go for it. Sorry. Yeah. So, right. so yeah, we did we did a full survey in 97 and 99, and we found the the disease in um, in two locations at the east and the and the west of the of what was then known as Irian Jaya, now it's Papua and West Papua provinces of the Indonesian part of the island of New Guinea. And it's very important here to emphasize the difference between the two, the two halves of this island. So on the Indonesian side, there is a huge population of people, there's very intensive agricultural production, there's a lot of infrastructure, there's roads everywhere, and it's, it's a, a very, very much like South, any, any other Southeast Asian country. And on the PNG side of the border, it's a totally different story, especially adjacent to the border. Um, there's shifting cultivation, slash and burn agriculture, um, much lower population and vast, vast areas uh, of, of, of basically land where there's just, just um, uh, villages here and there and not a high population. And that, that's very significant um, to the rest of this story, I guess. And also, um, there's no really, there's no huge citrus industry in PNG. There's small orchards can be found here and there providing, uh, supplying local markets, but there's no sort of great large export industry or anything like that. It's um, citrus to PNG is very much a backyard nutrition issue um, and, and sort of low level production. The PNG Indonesia border runs right from the top of the island to the bottom. Um, there's only one road across the border, and this is the photos of it from back back then in those days. Um, and, and that's up up near, right near the northern northern coast, which is where this story is located. Um, and I don't know if you can see my mouse, but this is a, a lady from one of the PNG villages walking across the border with banana planting material. They, they do their gardening. They, they're allowed to do their gardening in the no man's land on the other side of the border um, because that's their traditional, their, their traditional gardens, basically. And of course, all the way down from the north to the south, there's human beings, insects, animals, whatever. It's just totally every second of the day, organisms are crossing that border. There's, it's totally, it's, it's, it's totally um, pervious. So HLB was found by a, a Narkia, Narks, sorry, Narkia. Narkia is the National Agri Agricultural Quarantine and Inspection Authority of PNG. So we've been doing joint surveys together in Narkia in its earlier forms um, since 1992, I think. Um, so it was found in Vanimo, Sandown province in, in September of 2002. So the first two stars here are what we found in 1999. Then three years later, it pops up here in Vanimo on the other side of the border. So the incursion region um, is very low population, inaccessible terrain, and it's 
just, I'm just em emphasizing here the difference from intensively managed orchards and, and high populations. And um, if you can see my cursor, the actual first record, this, this is a, a view of part of the town of Vanimo. And this area here was the um, Indonesian consulate. And that was the first, first positive tree was found in the Indonesian consulate. But that's not, that's not as I'll mention in a minute, that's not the end of the story. So a bunch of HLB delimiting surveys were conducted by Nakia together with the Secretariat of the Pacific Community um, based in Fiji. So I, I, I kind of changed jobs from, from NARCS to SBC for a few years. So that's why I have this information. And so we did um, delimit, delimiting surveys in 2002, shortly after the incursion, a couple of months later, we got in 2003 and 2005. And importantly, we timed these surveys for November because that's the, um, generally the time when the citrus start flushing in that area, which is very important for, for, for the psyllid activity. Um, so inspecting backyard citrus trees in and around um, Vanima, where the, where the disease first appeared. Um, in the second year, we also included Wewak, and in the third year, we also included Madang. Madang, Vanima, and Wewak were, were surveyed in the, um, in the third year. So basically this whole area of the north coast So the early, early surveys generated, generated a lot of interest. The, all the villages that we visited, were, everybody was really keen to know what was going on and a lot of interest in, in identifying, knowing what, this, what the insect looks like. Um, and an interesting bit of feedback we got was most people didn't realize what was happening to their trees. And this is partly because of the, the fact that they're, they're, they're not production trees, they're basically growing in sand, they're not fertilized, they're showing all the nutrient deficiencies. And many of the HLB symptoms are the same as nutrient deficiencies. So it's quite hard to pick. But one thing we got back, some interesting feedback we got from people was they were told us their fruits have started tasting bad. That, that thing, that sour fruit thing that was mentioned earlier. Um, that, that's in, that, in this sort of village situation, backyard situation, I guess it would be the same in Northern Australia. Um, that might be the first thing people notice before their trees later go on to, um, to die. A little bit about the sample collection. This is, this is 20, 20 years ago. We have slightly better techniques now. Um, very important at that time to surface sterilize the, the samples, the, um, the leaf samples, so that we're not moving um, psyllid eggs around. Um, we cut out the PTLs and midribs so that you're in, it's like an enrichment procedure. You're, you're raising, you're concentrating just on the phloem tissue, which will have the bacteria in it more than the the lamina tissue does, and we desiccated everything over anhydrous calcium chloride back then. Um, and if you desiccate this material in the fridge, if you, if you have a, a keep the, the temperature low, you end up with a perfect sample, um, chopped up, um, chopped up squares of um, desiccated green material with none of the oxidative product pro products that um, degradative products of oxidation, etc., that make the tissue go brown and black that interfere with PCR testing later on. So the first lot of um, PCR testing was done in Australia and in France. Um, that was because the SBC didn't have a laboratory to do molecular work. And then we got, got, our, got our act together and got our, set up a, a molecular lab during 2002, during 2003, sorry. And then all the testing was done at the, um, in, in Fiji at the SBC laboratory. So the sort of the conclusions of it, the, the psyllid was widespread in Vanamo town and up and down the coast for about 50 kilometers, right up to the, to the Indonesian border. Um, we couldn't find it inland. We went quite, quite extensively inland. There's, there's not many roads there, um, but we went as far as we could. And this didn't change over three years, basically. It, it didn't, didn't spread further. Um, the HLB, as I mentioned before, that all the trees have a life history of nutrient deficiency, stress and neglect, et cetera. So the symptoms are masked. Um, and we, so we found very low levels of HLB infection in 2002 and 2003. We, we sampled 72 trees. Uh, that's the whole business of chopping samples and returning them overseas. Um, got four positives. And in 2003, 48 trees with 12 positives. More, a bit more detail about it. Um, so the disease was restricted to this one town and a bit, bit, little bit nearby. We found some nice evidence of how the disease is clustering. The um, typical plant um, 
plant pathology epidemiological studies and disease focus expansion. So trees that were negative changed to positive in, in the time that we were looking at them. I'll talk about that again in a minute. And also we've got evidence of probably independent introductions. When we went five kilometers west of town to a village called Lido, we found these, these really well-established, highly infected trees um, and I suspect that was an earlier incursion. It wasn't really the, the first place it came was not the Indonesian consulate. It was probably to this village. And similarly, we've got one tree uh, uh, far out of town in the other direction. And this stuff was all published at the time in 2005. Um, this, this whole study was, was published in Australasian plant pathology. So just to focusing again on that spreading thing, I think this is an interesting point to make. So these were the two in, I kind of tried to take this photo as the plane was sort of circling, ready to land and sort of tried to sort of portray the area. So that's the town of Vanimo. It's on this little peninsula sticking out into the sea on the north coast of the island of New Guinea. And so the, those two gray stars were the first two infection foci in 2002. So when we came back in 2003, this was the only spread was to a, a, a two, ad two adjacent trees, oh, sorry, nearby trees in, in that one part. And sorry, when I say new spread, trees that were negative then turned positive um, in, in 2003 were just those two. And then similarly, trees that were negative in 2002 uh, became, sorry, in 2003 were positive in 2005. So I'm just, I'm just emphasizing here the limited amount of spread. When you look at that, that view, there's l large expanses of grass, there's roads, there's buildings, Citrus trees are just one or two here and there in people's backyards. Um, there's no citrus orchards in the area. Maybe 30 kilometers up the road, there was a small citrus or orchard run by the Department of Primary Industries that, had, that we used to visit and, and the disease never arrived there. So again, just comparing the disease focus expansion. So if you look at the literature, you can find all these examples of how, and I just picked this one example, um, of how the disease in a planting of 20,000 trees um, 16, 16 trees exploded into 2,880 infected trees in two years. Whereas if you can't come back to our little semi-urban, peri-urban, whatever the word is you want to use, this, 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 this large, small town, I guess, um, with all its spacing of the citrus trees. And so within 700 meters of that initial fo infection focus, um, two infected trees increased to seven infected trees after, after a year. So it's a totally different situation. It, it, there's no explosive rapid spread. So the, the, there's a lot of um, uh, debate about what to do next at this time. Um, we decided that eradication of, of vectors using insecticides wouldn't be possible. Eradication of the diseased trees would be very hard. You pretty much have to eradicate everything within 50 meters. So first you'd have to kill all the insects with a, with a toxic chemical, then you'd have to come back and, and destroy the trees. Um, and this is basically, these trees are in people's backyards. They, most people cook outside, there's outdoor kitchens under the trees. It's just totally, totally out of the question. It's not, it wasn't gonna be eradicated. And sim similarly, it's a single geographical unit. At one end of, the, of this area, you've got um, massive infection levels and insect levels in, in Indonesia, in the town of Jayapura. Um, and at the other end, you've got a limited outbreak um, and a very porous border. So if you went to the effort of eradicating, it would just come back. That was the conclusion. So instead of the, so the response strategy was instead of a, a designing some sort of local control uh, method, you reducing sources of inoculum, um, the government of PNG went for an overall na national campaign of quarantining the region. Um, and since most of the spread was in infected or in infested infected plants, um, there was some really lucky things here that helped. Um, that they immediately gazetted some laws and made some restrictions on movements of plants. And a, ve a very important thing is that marcotting is not part of the culture. People don't market in PNG, it's, it's just not done. Um, and the other good thing that helped out, there's no decent roads out of that area. If there's one road is open for a few months in the dry season, but apart from that, it's only by plane and, and by sea. And just as a, an aside here, this, the photograph of this tree, um, we, it was full of leaves and providing shade and fruit and whatnot in 2003 when we tested it positive. And by 2009, it looked like this, just 
emphasizing what a bad disease this is. So what the government did, what Narkia instituted at the time was a, an awareness campaign with things like posters all over the place. We did some radio broadcasts. Um, this is a very popular thing in PNG to do this sort of public speaking thing. So we, we went around with the, the loudspeaker and talked to people, etc. And this had a very good response at the time. And it was again, all about um, encouraging backyard nutrition, not about protecting a big industry. And so this is the, the, the bit that I think is particularly, um, makes this situation particularly unique um, in the world. This is the only place that I know of where I think this, the, the disease and the insect have fizzled out. They have not exploded and, and spread across the whole country and not become a major epidemic. So um, after that period of the delimiting surveys, um, Narkia and Narks continued to do its usual work, which is not just citrus trees, but general plant health surveillance near the border. And so in 2009, the levels of the disease were, were going down. Only eight psyllids were collected and one tree out of 20 was positive. In 2012, we couldn't find any psyllids and we couldn't find any disease. And in 2016, we returned again for one of our regular surveys, a couple of positive trees um, and a small number of psyllids. But the interesting thing is some of them were mummified nymphs with um, the, the biocontrol um, agent. And these were found on, on again on the curry leaf and the mock orange, Mariah paniculata and Bergera kunigiae. And meanwhile, um, we have good evidence that this thing is not widespread across PMG. Every time we see a suspicious leaf tree, we sample it. And then that, and those samples have built up to 107 individual HLB tests um, by 2021. So the parasitoid finding was followed up immediately the next year with a special trip. Um, and as mentioned before, um, the two, the two most well-known parasitoids, um, they have different exit strategies or whatever. So from, we went back to that original tree, the one that the nymphs came from in, just in somebody's front yard in Vanimo town and 40 nymphs were collected from the same tree. 15 had the exit holes in the abdomen and 13 were obviously parasitized. And the conclusion is it's most likely to be that, um, that second insect, insect the um, Diaphorensertis alligarhensis. Sorry, I'm not an entomologist. I got all this information from our entomologists. Um, so the interesting thing is in 20 years, how did we get from this? That's a sweep net full of psyllids from 2003 or two or whatever to this, that's a bunch of really excited entomologists who found a tree with psyllids on it. They state, you imagine you come to Vanimo and you spend a few days and you can only find one tree with a few psyllids on it. That is, that is an amazing transformation. And I think that's the key to why this disease hasn't spread. It's this crash, it's an in huge crash in the population of the psyllids. At one time, there were millions of psyllids in this area. Some large Mariah trees were just literally wriggling with psyllids. They were just covered in insects and now they're gone. So what's, what's the reason for this? There's probably more questions than answers here. The parasitoids, maybe obviously something to investigate further. Just the peri-urban disease epidemiology, this whole thing of how a disease spreads, you know, through a town as opposed to across an orchard. And an interesting thing was thrown up um, by entomologists here in Australia when we sort of spoke to them about it is perhaps um, there could be a role of this, this the green tree ant. Um, we call it green tree ant in Australia, other names are weaver ant, golden weaver ant, yellow tree ant. Um, this thing has done, has, has been used traditionally in, in um, biocontrol for centuries in, in, in China and other places apparently. So that's it, just a list of the names of the people who were involved back in those, the old days right up to more recently from both PNG's National Agricultural Quarantine Inspection Authority and us in NARCS. And mentioned that the money, that the SBC money came from the European Union and um, our NARCS money um, comes from another part of our department, the International Plant Health Surveillance Program. Thank you. Thanks very much, Richard. And uh, that's very interesting. And that is, did actually, actually leave on a brighter note, I thought. Uh, <laughs> even if we don't know quite uh, what the reason is for this sort of population, I guess, decline. Uh, it's still very interesting. Uh, it could hold some promise as well. But I think that's an interesting point around commercial versus maybe backyard 
growing as well. So if there's anyone in the audience who've had experience with that as well, it'd be interesting to hear your thoughts on whether, I guess, Richard, whether it somehow spreads faster or uh, transmission is, is much quicker across a commercial crop. Um, we gave that example before. And what, just, just on your work in Papua New Guinea, what was the sort of hardest thing because um, there was quite a lot of success and positive stories there. But what was the hardest thing in um, this work and sort of looking at how to manage it and how to monitor uh, HLB and, and the silly? I, I think the hardest thing was just the remoteness of that area. Like we had lots of discussions about um, when, we, when we realised the change, what was changing in the population, we were saying things like, oh, we only go there once once every few years. What We don't really know whether it goes up and down in between times. What about if we get someone to sweep that tree, the one with the tree that was wriggling with insects once upon a time? What about yeah. if we get someone to sweep that tree every month and send send the trap contents, the contents down to the to the Nakia lab, et cetera? And it's just, it all became too hard. We, we couldn't, couldn't get that kind of it, um, ongoing re research to happen because it's such a remote area. There's, there's yeah. no... There's no no um, very small de departmental presence there, and nowadays it's it's actually changed a bit. There's there's a because of the, the border post. There's there's a good Nakia presence there, but there wasn't in wasn't that much in the early days. So that was probably the hardest thing. Do you think there was? Um, I mean, the fact that you didn't go at Russia, and I guess you had a lot of pesticides and or insecticides. I mean, do you think that could have contributed to maybe a, a better outcome uh, in this case? Oh, d definitely. I mean, the, the key thing in, in that response was that um, uh, we were in the position where we could consult with experts. So as soon as this happened, I was getting getting expert advice from France, from South America, South, South Africa, sorry, um, from um, Florida, um, all um, entomologists and plant pathologists and, and, and also um, the University of Sydney, an expert on the psyllids there. So we consulted with them and said, look, what, what the hell can we do that, that's going to work here? And we even discussed things like um, uh, uh, oil sprays as a way of, of killing the insects without spreading poisons across the town. And we realized that, you know, trying to get a, a mineral oil spray up into a, a, a citrus tree that's um, 15 meters high would probably requires a huge tractor and a big pump. And these things don't exist in places like that. Um, mm -hmm. And and it, and it was it was timely because the the author the Nakia authorities, the upper management, they were they were all leafing through chainsaw chainsaw catalogues. They were all everybody was <laughs> dying to get trying to get in there and do a good eradication. So it was it was great that we got this expert advice from outside um, and said, no, we calm down, we can't do that. Let's take it this way instead. And and yeah, I think it's it's a great story because it seems to have worked quite well. Yeah, no, definitely. And uh, I guess just on that, sort of whether there's a parasitoid there or some beneficials that are that are working well, what's, do you know, is there any further work that's looking at that specifically? Is there a specific project that's, uh, you know, focusing on that as a potential? Yeah, I guess um, we were discussing this with our, our, our my entomology colleagues just just yesterday, really, about this. We, we didn't get much further than that tentative identification um, because the um, better quality samples are needed. And yeah. so I think at, at the moment, since we haven't been there for six years, um, I think it's it's a situation that's crying out for a bit of a resampling, a reinvestigation, um, a, 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 a visit um, yeah. by somebody, a group of entomologists and plant pathologists um, to try and follow it up. Sounds good. That's it. And it's a great night to, to leave on. And um, if you can uh, stick around, uh, Richard, uh, that would be great. We would appreciate you staying uh, if you have the, the time. And uh, we may have some questions at the end. Um, but thank you so much uh, for coming today and, and presenting. And it's uh, it's really exciting uh, to see a really positive story as well about um, the management and, and what can be done. So thank you very much, Richard. Okay. Thank you.